I'd like to make the next quick introduction to Dr. Steve Wong. He's from Fuktomi, and I've been actually, I live in Hong Kong, and Steve is there a lot, um, and I've been chasing him for years, and this is the first time I've actually met him. So I'm so excited that he's here to talk to us, and he's going to, you're going to learn a lot about what's happening with China and the national sword and the green fence, and Steve, thanks for coming today. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for the invitation, and it's my pleasure to share my thought and my experience in this industry. And I have been in this industry for 34 years, and I actually recycle different kind of plastic, including post, chemi post petrochemical, post industry, and also post consumer. Today, I probably would very much concentrate on the on our industry, and at the same time also uh, we look at these topics, including economic value, environmental cost. I must uh, talk a little bit about envi environmental cost. Since the, the 80s last century, China has been achieving rate of growth from time to time more than uh, or I would say double digit. And now Chinese government realized there's a big price there to pay or they already been paying, which is not like in many terms. Instead is our soil, water and air. So that's why we have this uh, latest changes or I would say regulatory changes. It's the first time that you know, Chinese government actually impose a complete ban on plastic scrap import. A lot of people might think uh, why they do this. There are lots of people involved in it. There's a lot of employment and also import duty that they can earn. I think China now they realize there's a big price they to pay if they don't really do it correctly or if they cannot uh, regulate the industry. So this is also one of the things that we, we look at because, because of the impact. Because uh, every year there's more than 7 million tons of scrap imported into China. So this scrap have to find their homes. And most of them are the post-consumer. And post-consumer scrap are the most difficult to, to recycle. When I say difficult, it's from the economic standpoint. It's not like really difficult to recycle. It's, uh, uh, people in the industry, right, they always look at profitability. They look at money. They look at how they can survive. So it's quite different than the government standpoint. Um, plastic scrap, basically, we uh, divide it into three categories when we talk about collections. I remember when I started my business in the 80s, last century, in those days, there, were, there wasn't much post-consumer. Instead, we have post-petrochemical, and most of the post-petrochemical material are from Houston. This is, uh, or still is the place for lots of uh, scrap coming out from post petrochemical during the refinery of uh, plastic material. And second is a post industry. Nowadays, this um, stream is getting less and less because lots of fat, plastic factory, they recycle the scrap themselves, as, especially like film blowing factory, because this it's a single material and they can recycle them and then put it back to the extruder and make like garbage bags. The, the most difficult scrap from the industry nowadays we see could be from, from the automobile industry because these material or this scrap, they can be mixed and also they can be like with additive or glass fiber, film retardant. It's really difficult to recycle, first of all. And after also it's very difficult to find the application. I think this is also uh, one of the big, biggest, one of the problems that we face nowadays because it's not only recycling, it's find the application. And of course now we look at this post-consumer, this is what we normally see nowadays. I would think uh, with seven and a half million tons of importation into China of plastic scrap, probably more than 70-80% of them are post-consumer. And out of this post-consumer, lots of them need labor sorting. Thanks God, nowadays we have uh, technology, we have uh, electrostatic to separate 
black color material, uh, like PS from ABS, and also we have um, near infrared to separate color and also to separate different types of material. So uh, China actually imports from like the 80s from zero to nowadays 700 or 7 million something tons of plastic scrap. If China don't, don't control, right, the number will go up to like more than 10 million tons. And then for the whole world nowadays, we have uh, around about 12 million tons of uh, scrap plastic exporting from different developed countries. So just now we talk about this uh, pollution to the air, soil, and water. Now uh, I'll talk about green fence and uh, national shore. For most of the people here, uh, they are involved in the recycling of plastic. Probably know about what is uh, green fence. Green fence is something introduced in 2013. It was an um, initiative that the Chinese government simply, simply enforced of the existing law. Why I say existing law? Uh, because there's been lots of regulation, there are lots of uh, rules governing the recycling industry. From time to time, uh, for different reasons, the enforcement of these regulations is not really properly done, especially in some part of China. Um, they, they probably like, uh, some of the scrap, you know, can be easily imported to, to the Guangdong port. But that doesn't mean that this can be imported to Beijing, not Beijing, but the Tianjin or Qingdao. You know. uh, this um, Green Fence and also National Shore um, are the initiative that the Chinese government to make sure that the law and the regulation are properly enforced. And with this regulation, every time when the Chinese government introduced this kind of like um, initiative, the huge problem because a lot of uh, scrap used to be imported to China without any problem, just a matter of like, cost. When this um, en enforcement, uh, the government put in place, right, the, the Chinese authority actually catch people and put them in jail because of the, the non compliance of the, of the regulation. So that scales of people, and then a lot of uh, scrap, you know, because of this, the, the, the recycler or importer, they were diverted these to different countries. And then uh, this year, what happened is, the problem is getting more and more serious, and the Chinese president realized that, especially because of the media, the media always talk something, uh, I think in our industry we call it like negative. In general, you know, the, the, the public availance of the, of the people realize during the course of recycling you will create pollution and also um, the, the media always like to film the factories that they use child labor, they don't handle the, the water treatment properly and then the one that actually with the proper um, facility and also have the proper water treatment, normally they would not like to have the media to take the filming uh, uh, for, the, for the media, for the, to put it up on the TV and also on, on, the, on, the, on the public media. So for this reason, the, the Chinese government always see the negative side of the industry. And then uh, this year in, April, the president for the first time spoke about this uh, possible ban on some of the scrap, and they also want to restrict the importation in terms of quantity and also quality. And what happened is, right, uh, finally, what has been decided, and also has the government has filed, filed with uh, WTO that in earliest will happen will be like next year they will have a complete ban on the plastic scrap import. That will give a really huge impact to the whole world because of the plastic scraps, you know, the lot of them they need to find home. So now we had to look at how we're gonna do with this uh, seven million tons 
uh, scrap where, where where these scraps has to be recycled. I think there are two ways. One might be recycling at the source where the scrap generated, and the other way is to recycle in Southeast Asian country. Uh, as I mentioned, there's more than two and a half million tons uh, of scrap because of 75% and 25%. So these are post-industry, and these are the material that we can easily recycle them. And uh, the problem we will have, right, if we don't handle this scrap properly, uh, this 7 million ton of scrap will go to landfill, uh, incineration, and also uh, ocean. And just now we talk about circular economy. In fact, it is uh, true that if we, if we handle the scrap properly, we'll be able to achieve circular economy, create employment, and also do better for the, for, for the world, for the, for the ocean, and also for the environment. So even China, one of the reasons why China want to stop importation of scrap because China actually found themselves have a lot of scrap, especially post-consumer or from municipality. And the, the imported scrap is always easier to recycle compared with the domestic one. i give you one example. In, in, a, in a state, uh, for PT bottle, our soft drink bottle, normally we get a deposit when we return our bottle. And then for one ton of uh, PET bottles, right? in fact, through the system, this one ton of bottle has been paid more or less like 2,000 US dollar because of five cents each. And I rough uh, calculate how much you know, if, uh, the system had to pay out for one ton of bottles is more than 2,000 US dollar. But in China, the only incentive um, the, the, the government have or the, the system, actually there's no system. The only incentive is uh, economic value. That means if the price of the PET is good, the market price is good, then lots of people will go out to collect the scavenger, you know, even in Hong Kong too. In Hong Kong, there isn't any system nowadays. So nowadays, because of the uh, possible ban, also because the market price is low, we, the, all these are... Uh, uh, bottle or film scrap will end up either uh, incineration, landfill, or uh, in, the, in the ocean. So that, that is a problem. And, and then the number that you see, because at this moment China have uh, 230 of 246 million tons of solid waste uh, uh, being recycled, and then they're going to increase to, to 200, 250 million by 2020. So this is also the government's determination to have um, recycle, uh, to have solid waste recycle as much as possible. So this is also one of the objective that they want to achieve if they stop the importation of plastic scrap. So next one, two years, we will see there will be like imbalance of uh, supply and demand. And at the same time, the, the, one of the things that we see, I would put this as like opportunity because um, because of six, seven million tons not allowed to import. A lot of uh, small recyclers or a lot of recyclers, uh, they um, move or they divert their operation in Southeast Asian country. And it is an um, opportunity for people in Southeast Asian country, and also it is an opportunity for somebody that who can use like machinery automation to do the recycling. And I also think it is an opportunity for the recycler in Australia. Because nowadays, uh, to give you an example, probably people in the trade know that, like film scrap, the, 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 we call it grade A, uh, PE film, used to be selling 600 US dollar per ton. Today, the price dropped by one third. And then our selling price of recycled pallet is more or less the same as like before. At the same time, uh, most of the factory nowadays with uh, the, all the books fill up, and also lots of um, um, downstream manufacturer or customer, they like to pay upfront or they like to pay huge deposit in order to secure delivery. So I actually think this is also opportunity here. The other uh, impact that we see, or maybe we call it like change in our industry, is not only the people who do the processing of scrap, instead also the downstream industry. Uh, I give ex a few examples, like EPS is an uh, expanded 
polystyrene, and these are the, we call it polyform. Um, this, the biggest application nowadays for this material is to, to, to recycle them and then put form an agent to make photo frame. And this is a very big market. Um, a long time ago, uh, most of this material went to landfill, and today uh, there's a quite a few manufacturers they move to Southeast Asian country, and after they, re they recycle or after they get the recycled material, they make it into photo frame and export to country like state or Western country or even um, consume domestically. And the other one is a film blowing. I think film blowing is much more easier and more, lots of, or most of the PE film without lamination can make it into pellet and ultimately making it into different kind of um, uh, PE film and maybe for agriculture and as well as like for garbage bags. Of course, we also have profile pipes, lots of example. So, so in China, in the future, the, the, the number of people involved in the plastic industry or recycling will be getting less because of this um, uh, compete ban on plastic scrap import. And most of the people nowadays, they, when they choose where to move, they, to, I, I think at this stage, right, they move to Malaysia, Thailand, and, um, and Vietnam. At the same time, I also visit this country. For myself, I'm a recycler. This problem also affects us very much. So we used to sell a lot of material in China. We actually have factory in China and also in Hong Kong. Because of this, we also had to move to a country like just mentioned Thailand, Malaysia, and Vietnam. And our biggest challenge that we have is in fact, these countries, they also have some control on the importation. There's, there's, um, there's, a, there's a regulations, um, especially for the agricultural uh, waste and also for post-consumer. There's a, there's a restriction on what you can import. So I always share my thought with uh, people in the industry that people move out or recycle and move out from China because of the regulations. And one day, it is not surprised that this Asian country, when they see lots of uh, post-consumer uh, scrap coming into the country, and then they do not uh, handle the residue or the waste properly, right? Uh, maybe they also will impose some kind of like restrictions or some kind of ban on certain kind of material. So this is the biggest challenge everybody had. And I believe in the end, plastic scrap has to be recycled at places that um, the scrap generated. So I really believe this is an opportunity you know, for a lot of countries to recycle their own um, scrap. And in China especially, when we talk about uh, plastic scrap, we talk about like resources. And in China, they call this is resources. But when it comes to like imported one, they call it garbage. They call it foreign garbage. So this is the, the, the terms that they give. So that means a lot of people, they don't, or a lot of countries, they don't like to handle other people's scrap. Instead, their own one, they call it resources. So next one, two years will be um, very, very challenging in our, in our industry. And also, uh, there will be a lot of changes. And there's a lot, a lot of uh, crisis and also opportunity. So depending on how you look at it and where or which direction you go. So um, <clears throat> what happened is I, I, I personally believe, and I, in fact, this is what happened, we, we discussed earlier, we, um, we heard, heard about like ocean waste. And why why, this, why uh, we have ocean waste? Apart from um, consumer or there's no system, it's also because of the kind of material that used. And this material is more and more difficult to, to to, uh, to handle or to recycle compared with others. I'll give example. Um, uh, like the chocolate or ch ch uh, chocolate packaging. So these are the things that are very colorful, but then it's very difficult to recycle. In general, I think plastic is um, doable, but it also is terrible when we talk about like the, the, the kind of um, material that you use. And a lot of people you know, might not know that there's more than 40,000 different types of plastics. Why I say 40 different types? 40,000, 40, right? Because there's a lot of combination. 
I think in general we know like one to seven. One is uh, PD, uh, one is PET, two is uh, uh, HDP, three is PVC, four is HDP, five is PP, and six is PS. And then the seven, the seven is everything. Why is everything? Because uh, especially uh, in the car industry, because of the specific requirement, um, the engineer had to put like certain material together to make a plant. And also to achieve certain characteristics, you have to put like additive to make it more heat resistant, to have a, uh, to put like glass fiber, glass fiber to be more, more um, uh, enforced. So in the end, there's only a few types of plastic that we can recycle easily. And I'm talking about like lamination film again. Uh, for example, like when we have uh, the, the packaging for dog and cat food, okay, you notice that the packaging look really nice, shining. And this shining bit actually is a coating or lamination of PET. And PET is 260 degrees to melt, and then the PET is like 190 or 200. So for some of the recyclers, you probably understand that um, it's not easy to recycle them unless you have a proper machine to do it. And even after you recycle, because of the trace of the PET, you will not be able to use this uh, recycle pellet for film blowing. So these are the example. And also, um, I, I live in uh, California. I think state is a country that uh, when we have a party, you see people use like Ford and also uh, different kind of packaging. And then after the party finished, then they all go to the trash and then ultimately go to landfill. I think go to landfill is better than uh, left somewhere and then eventually go to the ocean. So now we talk about, I think everybody talk about um, upstream collection. In fact, Hong Kong is a really good example. We, we, first of all, the, the public awareness of um, collection and also about uh, environmental protection is not very really much compared with the young generation. Uh, and then secondly, even after this scrap, you know, the separate and then collect it, and then the government or the system will have a um, um, truck you know, to collect. And normally, okay, this is supposed to be for recycling. I think because of the limitation, don't know this very well. You know, yeah. uh, so in the end, <laughs> lots of people will not know that this uh, uh, separated scrap, like, actually, I would say 100%, I would, not, I would not let you say 99%. In fact, ultimately, they go to landfill. Yeah, so, so collection and people who can recycle them and application, these are, are the things that you always have to put together. Same as like in recycling, we need to have the um, interaction of the government, general public, industry, and probably education and also lot, lots of things, media, yeah. So to put them together. So this is the challenge. So now this is more example about like separation, but this will not work in Hong Kong at this moment, but maybe one day you will work. <laughs> okay, now we come to this uh, sustainability. Um, okay, now we talk, we, we, we talk about this um, scrap. Now, nowadays, there's been lots of uh, publicity and also documentary about uh, like microplastic. This is also the term that I heard you know, like not many years ago. And in fact, you know, this is a bigger problem than anything. And this is the problem that you don't see, you don't feel it. When you feel it, when you see it, it might be it's already too late. And we need to do this for our next generation. I think um, today we have a lot of experts who will talk about this you know, more than what I know. And also we should really look at it. And um, for me, being in the industry, right, making money is important uh, for us or for my company to survive. But then to have the awareness or to have the idea or to to be able to do something for the world, right? Is this something that really sustainable? Is not, is something that, okay, money cannot buy. Is something that uh, industry had the responsibility to do it. So I, did, I just come across this um, most important thing, you know, uh, if we don't do this correctly, we might have uh, or cause uh, carcinogenic uh, infertility and affect growth, also uh, hormonal abnormality. So now we, we also talk about our future generation. It's not only like for us, and, and we talk about like things can happen like in 15, or in like half century, one century, 
and also when you look at the number, uh, the problem is getting more and more serious. And um, a lot of people might argue, uh, with this uh, toxin, how much we eat, you know, we become, we do to, to get cancer. And, and also, are we the most lucky one to get it or not, you know? Uh, I think the, 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 the and, and also the ocean. I also don't believe, to be honest, seven million tons, eight million tons of the ocean trash every year. I don't, I don't believe this number because the whole world um, exporting like uh, 12 million tons of uh, scrap and six, seven million tons go to China. But, but, but we don't challenge this number. What I know is a lot. It's a lot. So, so much that, you know, um, we cannot handle. So much that it might affect the whole world. Uh, give an example, like one uh, carrier bag, you know, can break up into like thousands of uh, small particles or microplastic. So we don't have to talk about this seven or eight million tons of trash. We only talk about like small quantity can cause a lot of problem. Okay, I think um, this is all. And I will say thank you for the patience and I hope um, um, this uh, information we share together, uh, we will be able to make use of it. Thank you. There's a gentleman here who wants to ask a question. If you could identify yourself and then ask the question, that'd be great. Thank you. Tim Silverwood from Take Three. Just wanted to know what this might do to the, uh, the quantity of virgin plastic that China will consume in the next uh, interim. In, in respect to the oh, green fence. Maybe I'll give you the, the number <clears throat> from the last couple of years. China actually used about 80-something million tons of plastic. 80 something million. So out of this 80 something million, um, 7 million tons is from recycled imported plastic. Uh, this is a recycled one, imported one. And 17 million is from domestic. So all these two numbers from recycled plastic is 21. And then it's about 20 million tons are the imported um, plastic. So most of these are the polyethylene, poly, uh, uh, they are polyolefin, most of them. Yeah. Actually, the biggest application is still polyethylene PE. And the important one is about 40 million. And every year, China has a growth of like 5% on the import. But of course, next year might be a little bit different because of the uh, latest regulation that uh, they would not, they would not like, or next year, that they will stop importation of plastic scrap. Yeah, that may, the number might may change a little bit. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm totally convinced that there will be more and more recycled plastic scrap being used uh, in the plastic industry. So for prime material, it's more or less the same. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Uh, Paul Sharp from the Two Hands Project. Uh, is there any uh, move in China towards creating an environment where uh, reusable packaging becomes a big part of the packaging system, like refillables, consumer packaging, for example, uh, PET soda bottles, yeah. used once, thrown away. You go to Germany and the bottle is used again and again and again. So the bottle becomes reclaimed, washed, reused, not just recycled. I don't really think that China, so far I see, you know, people use bottle again and again. And, and in fact, uh, the, the consumption of PET bottle will only get more and more. Because as the cost of living, or I would say living standard, okay, is getting higher and higher every day. People are more affordable to use uh, bottle instead of many times, actually one time. They only use many times when, when they cannot afford, you know, yeah. I think the, the most of the people, the, the awareness of the uh, environmental protection is not that much, except, you know, the younger generation after they, the, the, after they have some education overseas or, or the, they've been to school and the teachers tell them what, what to do. You know? yeah. So actually for packaging, they don't use very much. Thank you, Stephen. Um, here in Australia, uh, as in the US, Europe and, and Scotland, UK, Wales, Ireland, there is the issue of the cost and the ability of the enterprises to gain the finance to put in the processes to enable to take it through to the pellet stage. So that, that does require a degree of innovation. Does China now look, to, as you your slide show, 
to be able to import the recycle it in pellet form rather than in bales? And if so, is, is there a methodology whereby we can work in with, the, uh, asso with your association in order to pro produce that, that mechanism and pathway? Yeah, actually China nowadays, instead of importing scrap, the, 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 there is no limit for us to import or we don't need import license to import recycled pellets. So this is what happened nowadays. Lots of uh, recyclers, they moved to uh, Southeast Asian countries to turn the scrap into pellets before they import. Then they don't need to have a license. And in fact, from this country, they don't need to pay import duty, but they still have to pay 17% VAT. Yeah, and China also don't have any um, system yet uh, to give incentive for people who make or who recycle scrap into pallets. So far, especially for the imported one. For domestic one, they're working on this. And then for Hong Kong, uh, there's nothing like this at this moment, but they're still working on it. Mm. Yeah, thank you.